Hi Kamil, nice to see you here. Um, hi Zareen, good to see you as always. Um, so it's another chat session, uh, this is number 10. Um, and today is going to be really special because we have Jean Gardner with us. Um, I'm waiting for her to log on so that I can invite her onto a split screen chat with me. Um, so we're just waiting to see. Hi, Sarah. Nice to see you. Good morning. How's New York? Uh, we just. I'm just waiting for uh, for Jean to come on board. Some of you had um, a sneak preview of our uh, conversation last night. Just trying to figure out the technology for Instagram live chats and. Uh, to have both of us on the screen at the same time. So as usual, you know, the music is playing in the background and I'm um, chilling, waiting for Jean to arrive. Um, it's seven in the morning, I think, New York time. Oh, is it really? Uh, is it cold and cold and miserable? Um, Syrah, let me just quickly turn it down so I can hear you, see you, read you better. Um, Miserable means it's rainy or it's snowing. What's what's going on in New York? Um, raining, right. Well, spring showers, I guess. You're preparing for New York monsoons, but I'm sure it can't be that pleasant if you're sitting indoors under quarantine. Um, how many... I mean, Sarah, you listened to some of our conversation with uh, Jean and myself yesterday uh, at night while we were just testing the technology. We finally managed to make it work, which is amazing. Um, it was something new for me uh, and definitely something new for her too. So, uh, Sana, thank you. You will enjoy this conversation as soon as Jean shows up. Um, thank you so much. Sana has been, for everybody else on here, Sana Khan Yazi, who's just joined us, has been an incredible help in terms of downloading, saving, and uploading onto IGTV. So, uh, anybody who's been watching our uh, Instagram posts that are recordings of these uh, live chats and have been put onto IGTV, that credit goes to Sana, who's been an incredible friend and supporter for Cube Editors, and she's been doing this for me because I didn't know how to. Um, I'm a dinosaur, and uh, the technology just frustrates me, so Sana has been managing to uh, navigate and help me with that, which is uh, I am incredibly appreciative and grateful for because that's archived this material which I would have lost otherwise. So, uh, I am not sure where Jean is, but... Uh, <laughs> Sana. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I am the one who's grateful. That's, that, though, that's my gesture that should be going to you, not the other way around. <laughs> um, can you hear the music, you guys? Kamil? Kamil, have you received any more uh, acceptances or are we, are we going to see you shift to uh, USC in the fall? Uh, what other universities are banging on your door to bring you on board and add to their talent pool? Who else is out there? Um, I mean, you guys can may as well talk to me. I don't really have any anything necessarily set up in terms of content from my side. So we can chat till, till Jean shows up. Uh, it's very early in the morning. Uh, no, all done. Oh, great, Kamil. So where are you off to? Is it USC or is it Pratt? Who is going to be the lucky winner? I'm not sure what he's decided. I think uh, he's he's leaning towards uh, USC. I think he should go to Pratt, but then I'm an uh, East Sider, so uh, for me, California doesn't really make a huge amount of sense. But if that's what he wants, uh, so be it. Maybe Pratt in the end. There we go. So I think that would be fantastic. Uh, that would be really, really amazing. They would be lucky to have you, Kamil, as far as I'm concerned. I think that would be... It's an amazing school, but whenever you make up your mind, that's fine. Uh, either place, I think, whether it's Pratt or it's USC, either one will be... They will be very, very lucky to have you. So I'm really excited on their behalf that you're going there. Risha, hi, great to see you. I'm not sure if you've managed to see any of the other uh, chats that have been recorded and posted on the Instagram page, but um, I, 
hope you have and you've enjoyed them. I mean, you're back here today. I think today's would have been amazing as soon as we can get Gene to uh, come back online. Um, I'm not sure where she's at, whether she's caught up in a meeting or something. It's 7 in the morning there. So, she should be here. In the meantime, you guys can ask me whatever questions you have while we wait for her to sign on. Um, definitely got the number of hours across, correct? So, um, she should be here. We tested this yesterday. What sort of feedback have I been getting regarding the live chats? Well, uh, people are here. We can ask them what the general feedback is. Risha, have you watched any of the others? <laughs> That's the <that> check. <laughs> Hisham, you've made it. How fantastic is that? Mr. Hisham Yusuf, are you in China? Uh, where are you logging in from? And you managed to get Instagram to work for you. So that, that's pretty amazing. Um, yes, Trisha, great. Which ones did you watch? Were there any? I mean, Saira is asking for some feedback. What do you think? You have a question. Fantastic. Fire. Trisha, what's the question? You said it's a topical question. I'm all ears. see if she's here no you guys are all here no nope, Jean is not here yet which is very strange yeah good question is this lockdown good or bad for the local communities that you visit um, So I think that the local communities that we visit, which are not urban, um, in the middle of nowhere, I don't think I don't think this lockdown uh, affects them a whole lot, because they are still working on a very low budget for their subsistence, and that continues. So the little bit of business that they normally do is continuing. Uh, I think the lockdown is really more uh, impacting us in urban centers where there's a denser population. I think as we go out into rural areas where the density of the population in those communities we visit is very, very light in terms of acreage per, per square acre. So I don't think they're hugely affected. I think the ones who are really affected are the daily wage workers in the cities and our factories, our industries, people who are connected to an international uh, paycheck through orders of products being sent out. I think they're affected and the people who work for them. I think the rural community, because they are predominantly um, agriculture-based, the agricultural work continues, our food being prepared, continues the transportation for uh, things coming in from our farms and from our um, uh, wheat manufacturers, rice growers, sugar mills. I think all of that still continues. So those people who work work out there are not enormously affected. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but any of the places we visit, most of them being in the middle of nowhere, um, our heritage sites, our people are really poor and they're not really affected by a lot of what goes on in the urban centers in general. They live their own lives in their own time frame, in their own, their own processes. So I don't think this lockdown is really affecting them a whole lot. It's affecting us more than anybody else. I hope that answers your question. Everyone I've called and to check on uh, in terms of whether they need rations or money or they need any help, they've all sort of come back to me from Hala to Nagar Parker to Sevan to wherever saying, we're fine, and, you know, we're okay. If we need any help, we'll let you know. But it's been the people in in the centers that have... Uh, Masi Bina, you're here. That's fantastic. So good to see you. Jean, welcome back. This is amazing. Let me invite you. Yes, view, of course. So waiting for Jean's invitation to get to her. Masimina, lovely to see you. I hope you can see me and hear me. Jean, welcome back. Let me make this Good morning. 
Hello. Good morning. Here, I can see you loud and clear. We're both wearing fuchsia. This is fantastic. <laughs> the, ES, the ESP continues to baffle me. It's amazing. Yes, it does. It's it's more powerful than we have yet experienced, and Gosh. halfway around the earth, and we're sending <laughs> messages faster than digital. That's then the important the thing. So, Jean. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce you to the people who are here, and then we will sort of walk you through this. Thank you so much for last night's test chat. That has actually been wonderful. A lot of people who've seen it overnight have thanked us for sharing that with them. Uh, okay. So, for everyone who's here, um, Ali Hamza, uh, Shazad, um, uh, Ina Munir, Risha Moidi, there's a lot of friends of mine, Jean, who are here. Several are people I've known since my childhood. Some are newer friends. Uh -huh. Some of the people on the chat right now, the urban forest systems, some are uh, very high-end bankers who've been on ed editors with me. Uh, so there's a really wonderful mixed bag of people here in terms of their professional backgrounds. The one thing they all have in common is their love for nature, for their country, for the history, uh, and for Pakistan. So it's, it's uh, and, and I have an age bracket, everything from... 20 to probably um, 50, 55, uh, roughly. There's people from across other countries. I have people signing in right now from India, people from Lahore. There's a uh, family member who's just joined us from Dhaka. So we, you have an international audience at your hands, and we're both wearing the same color. We got dressed together. They don't even know that. So I'm going to quickly introduce you, um, folks. Jean Gardner um, is my history of architecture teacher from Parsons. We've known each other for 30 years. She is a powerhouse of vision, of ideas, of direction. She's been my mentor all, all these years. It doesn't matter if I've been in Dubai or in New Mexico or in Tokyo or now in Karachi. Uh, I will put past Jean, whether it's through an email or through Messenger, whatever it is I'm about to do. And without fail, her feedback has always been invaluable. So I thought this would be an amazing time to meet her. Uh, an environmental activist, she's an amazing writer, researcher, um, the accolades of fancy words that half of which I've never even heard in my life before on the little poster. But what I'm going to do is um, ask Jean to share a little bit about herself. And then I have a few questions that are relevant to the work that we do at the Edutours that we will discuss with her. So, Jean, thank you so much for giving us your time. I know it's this ungodly 7 o'clock in the morning time at your end. Um, it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you very much for taking your time out for us. Thank you so much for being my mentor continuously, even through this. It's a real experimental um, educational project that is a hybrid of history of tourism, of on-site learning, of architectural history, of a revival of heritage architecture, and our understanding of it, the ownership of a national heritage. So it's a really experiment model. As you know, I've been developing this for about eight years, and in the last year, it has really taken form, taken shape. More importantly than anything else, because I've given it the time, and one has to be ready for it. So I think I was ready to go into the next year. And I think having you here to talk to us about it would be amazing. The first question that I would have, because I've known you much better than everyone else, if you could do me a favor, please, and tell us all what it is that you do. And, and part two of that is, how have you seen yourself evolve in the last 30 years? Woo! <laughs> oh, God. That's... A multi-dimensional opportunity because here we are in the minute midst of a pandemic that just like we were talking about extra sensory perception has brought the world together so we have a small virus that is so powerful we're all joined in fear and this momentous decision about how we move into an unknown future. So here's this moment. 
and suddenly we reconnect and you're asking me well you know what has happened in these last 30 years since we i mean also we didn't have this capacity to sit together and cut through time and space so right away I should say time and place. You're in Pakistan, Karachi, I gather. I'm in New. I'm not in New York City. New York City is where I usually am. But I'm at my daughter's farm in Pennsylvania. So we leap to this uh, mega platform, and that to me is what is most interesting about where I am right now. I hear you talking about the hybrid that you have evolved as a teacher, as somebody who sees these multi-dimensions of time and space in the present. So I feel very strongly that's a common denominator between us. And I don't think we knew that 30 years ago, but... magnets and we're iron file filings and some magnet is drawing us together and bringing our very very different physical embodiment right now to focus on this moment in time so i have had an opportunity in the last few months to look back over my teaching for various reasons, not this pandemic, but other reasons. And what really strikes me is the need for reciprocity. Modern thinking is linear and supposedly progressive. So you and I agree it's not linear. Hybrid is your word. I would uh, use the word systemic. We're always pulling things that linearly would seem like, okay, well, whatever year it was we first met, 1980, whatever, whenever, 1990 when you were at Parsons, that's thinking linearly. But if you think in terms of these hybrids that you just mentioned, having tours that take people to stand on the earth in villages that are way back in time, well, I do something not nearly as powerful, but the common denominator is we have to keep listening to the earth at this moment in time. So that's been my trajectory and my, uh, like a spiral. You mentioned it. It's, um, molding paintings, carvings that are actually dynamic. Well, we're all in this, I think of it as a helix. So we're always coming back around a lot. For instance, a lot of unresolved issues from the 1960s are back around in my part of the earth. Black complaints about not being black people complaining about not being treated equally whether it was the black panthers or black lives matter now so this this question of democracy and equality it's coming back around in our faces because we never finished it so my concern is that in this helix that we don't keep repeating, repeating the circuits, that we actually realize it's dynamic. And now in the, what's called the Kali Uga, which I imagine some of your listeners know much more about than I do, but we know we're in a very violent phase of the Kali Uga, and it's going to last for a long, long time. In terms of your thinking... Thousands of years are not much, <laughs> but 
when you've been grown up in a culture like I have where the individual is pushed out of proportion, you want these things to happen in your lifetime. So what I've seen happen over the time when we first met is my, my greater understanding of how important it is to participate in the upward spiral. And the upward spiral would be that spiral that overlaps the downward spiral of the Kali Yuga. So these two things are going on simultaneously. And you can um, actually <laughs> learn about it mathematically. There is in English a, a book called The End of Time as We Know It by Robert Lawler. So he's using geometry, measuring the earth, well, now, unfortunately, is rarefied, is somehow sacred, and then people don't pay any attention to it. So he's using geometry to show that the Kali Uga is, in fact, a lens for us to understand today. So, do in the midst of we're going down into the, you know, inhaling of the universe before the universe is going to exhale again there's a beginning of something new and that's where i hope that my presence my teaching my exchange with you will not get caught up in the dualities these things like you mentioned yesterday you called it the other we're always oppositional. Well, yes. my understanding is that by being oppositional, particularly if we place ourselves as somehow superior to the other, then we're actually increasing the power of the other. So if the other is a violent, dangerous, totalitarian, uh, mass that wants control because of economic superiority in the system that exists, oppositional will just keep us going around and around like this while the greater dynamic of the universe takes us down. So Robert Lawler argues, and I have experienced this, keeping our eye on what you called... Uh, touching the cosmos, getting a vision of reciprocity with our feet on the earth, sitting on the earth, feeling the earth's vibration, but yet seeing a future that's a third choice, not oppositional. In other words, joining with others like you and I joining to build a clear vision and there's actually a dynamic in nature that explains this very easily and there's also a short story again I, I am so limited in referring to cultural um, icons in your part of the earth but in English the 19th century writer Edgar Allan Poe wrote a short story, which I will send you, um, and you can read it to send it to others if you want. It's called Maelstrom, M-E-M-A-E-L-S-T-R-U-M. -E -E and that's a biological phenomenon, or in, I should say ecological. In oceans, there are places of whirlpools that carry you down. And that's what we're having. The Kali Uga is carrying us down. So in actuality, there is in this downward whirlpool, this upward movement. And the short story, thank God, because I cannot follow Robert Lawler's mathematics. The book is in English, the authority on the kind of what I call the geometry of life. So in the short story, a ship captain gets caught in the downward pull, but he notices, like I think your uh, way of teaching, 
the group that you've gathered around you notices that there's another choice going into a future that's not dualistic and in the short story the ship captain notices that and he gets his ship in this upward movement so that's what in a very long-winded manner because i don't speak two plus two equals four because it doesn't two plus two equals or you one and one does not you and i do not equal two we equal some you know mathematical uh equivalent that i x potential x ponets x there's a word in english that i can never get the grows and doubles but my point is the captain sees the upward spiral and he gets into that and even though his life may not see our lives may not see the future we're trying to build that's how i explain what i've been doing these last 30 years is studying experiencing but i i go back to if we pay attention to our bodies if we sit on the earth and feel the what in english we call the ley lines the meridians of the earth we can go to this cosmic level with our feet on the ground and yet we can see what i just described and robert lawler has helped me see but now i'm experiencing it myself so that's what i've been doing for 30 years and teaching 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 and now as i've been telling you the whole school's in a turmoil about what we are going to do next fall i'm turning it over to you <laughs> so uh, once again uh, rare but i'm lost for words you know, Jean, it's so interesting. I've always enjoyed listening to you because everything is always so clear and so beautifully explained. But now I have a question for you, that if we're looking at these very Kantian kissing triangles, both are moving right next to one another, two different directions, and we're going to... ...to intercept and collide and create these unknown pieces of momentary magic to guide us into the future. Um, if that's if that's the basic premise of all of this, so I keep clicking my touching my screen because it keeps shutting off for some reason. Um, how do you see the very tangible on site, dusty, grimy, uh, tangible work that I'm doing? Uh, and feeling like this this is going to be a very important component in terms of educating us about ourselves from a point of view of a digital global village and digital nomads, which are in fact many ways like the nomads that were part of the empires when they moved before we had political boundaries as we have today. So how do you see these two spirals responding to the digital age that we are in right now, you and I, and the work that I do, which is extremely tangible, and it's very physical, and it's very earthed, and it's very much about owning the history and the spirit of that space in a physical manner, not just ideas. It's not romantic and fantastical. It's very real. It's difficult to get to. It's difficult to understand. It's difficult to traverse. It's physically exhausting and challenging. But also, therefore, it's much more um, rewarding because you come away with a sense of achievement as opposed to reading through books about the same and being able to make that journey uh, of exploring that site as short as you want interrupted by dinner and interrupted by a phone call but if when you're with us on a tour there is no room for any such interruptions you're on that journey it isn't even halfway done that journey actually completes when you come home so it's a real process of inhabiting slowness and being patient with it and yourself 
and holding back expectations, holding back projected results, and allowing yourself to surrender versus the digital age, which is instant gratification, all about speed, all about time, all about very, very small bite-sized um, acceptances and bite-sized information to chew and either just let out or absorb and forget. So where do you see these two? What kind of role do you think they play amongst each other in this sort of dumbbell condition? Dumbbell? <laughs> I'm going to have to look that up. I, the um, What I'm going to respond to are actual words that you used that are in my body now. So in other words, sound. And remind us that words are not what we're pointing. They point to something that we're trying to understand. So in other words, books may have gotten us through our educa modern educational system to think that the written word is it. And we've gotten isolated from living the living earth, which is evolving and moving through space. And we're what I call in English a hologram of the earth at the same time that we are immersed in it. In other words, we're not separate. We're not separate. So one word that you that really jumped out was inhabit. And this difference between going to the ancient sites, the ancient villages, leaving behind the digital, the quick, the um, information is not really what that word means. Informing. We are not, we don't want to be formed by the digital. So if we react rather than respond. Mm. So in other words, when you put aside all of the quote gadgets and distractions and you go and you sit on the earth, even if I go here, rock or a boulder we have lots of of boulders that were the stone fences initially that came with the last glacier so i can sit on the earth i can sit and there are messages coming you get messages just like we think we're getting messages when we are on the internet but if you're sitting and you're just open, you have to really open yourself because we are dissolving these boundaries. You, you use the word inhabit. Habits in a place. So if you're sitting on the earth and the habit of taking your phone and seeing what you are looking at through the lens, that's a habit. Put it away and sit on the earth, get a new habit. So it has to come through your body. It, ha it comes at what I call a feeling tone. It's not yet a word. We don't have words for this. Other than I use the word visceral, which means, you know, like what I hear when you're talking. Whew. But first I have to surrender to yes. the unknown. So those two words, inhabit, we have to have new habits, and we don't get the new habits from distraction or reaction. The digital technology of distraction is engineered to have us react, and you have to hold back. We want to respond. And again, I keep referring to the Sanskrit origins of our English words and the transmission over time. Respond has spanda, spontaneity. That's in the Sanskrit sounds. Sanskrit being a sound language, 
that connects right to places in your body that open. So you're sitting on the earth, you're feeling the impulses of the earth. And that's how I look at what you're trying to do, the hybrid. Because there are these tremendously old maps before boundaries. You know, in the United States, we call it bioregionalism. Okay, look at the water systems. But we know the English completely misunderstood the water systems in India and, you know, did wreck these elaborate ways in which water was collected and changed the climate. I mean, we, we have changed the climate. So, you know, we're really on the edge. The earth is evolving. A pandemic has hit us, a little tiny virus we can't even see with our eyes because we've controlled, we think everything big. And at the other end of it is the earth is on its own evolutionary path. We are not the summit of the evolution of the earth. We came out of where? The soil, humus, humans, the same word. So we're going to change. There's a biologist, uh, Lynn Margolis, who with James Lovelock developed what you all have known forever. The earth is alive. He also wrote about what she called symbiosis. So this is part of what I think our future uh, opens. Listening to the earth, like you said, or listening to a stone, listening to a bird. In other words, co-creating with other life forms that have continued to listen to each other. So who knows where your decisions to do the, the hybrid you have created, where did they come from? In, in uh, Sanskrit, there is a word, booty, and like Bodha Vista. Again, my English is such a bastardization of the real sound, but that is maybe equivalent to what we call in English intuition, but it's much more powerful. All of a sudden, I have it all the time. At night, there's Persephone. Look, this Greek mythological embodiment of the cycles of nature, which progressive linear thinking doesn't pay attention to. So we're way off here in the earth and everything else Old, old legends, which were teachers, are in another direction. So how do we get here? We listen to our bodies. You're connected back. I wonder how many, you know, thousands of years, the lineage behind you, the personal DNA lineage, let alone the spiritual lineage, is pouring through you and making, making the future. So surrendering, so we open, inhabit the inhabit physical world so we can use our gift of consciousness to help guide us to a alignment with these larger natural forces. And I go back to a childhood experience, and again, now, I hope you can translate this into words that your listeners will understand. There's a jump rope game that actually has come back, and I think there's people arguing to make it part of the Olympics. It's called Double Dutch. So mm. two people are holding the jump rope, and they're going like this. Well, this is, you have, we have to jump into systems that are huge beyond our comprehension. But the right. feeling of when to jump is coming from your body. Because we have three brains. The, there's a nerve, the vagus nerve that connects. Heart and the gut. And those communicate. We're not listening to what our gut knows, to what our heart knows. Science has 
science which came out of reaction to another pandemic, the Black Plague. What happened in Florence? That was the source of it. There's actually an Italian writer, Baccioni, who lived through the plague, Black Plague in Florence, 1348. It was about three years the plague lasted in Florence. And he wrote, everything collapsed from the pandemic, from the Black Plague. Every system of order collapsed. Well, historically, we can see that they already were collapsing, which I can think we, you and I, and your listeners also understand, or they wouldn't be here. This didn't come out of nowhere. The glaciers are melting. Bacteria and viruses that were frozen are being freed. We're bringing out of the earth oil, gas that was sequestered under the, the rock bedrock of the earth to keep it out of the atmosphere because it changes the atmosphere and kills us. So this sense in Florence that Baccioni saw and wrote about, everything collapsed to the extent that people were left to decide what was right in their own mind. And I would say we're left to decide what's the next step in our bodies. In Florence, there was so much superstition that the mind and what came out of it, scientific thinking in the arts, Brunelleschi, he and Donatello went to Rome and what were they doing in the junkyard of the forum? Trying to figure out architecturally how the dome in the Pantheon could have possibly held. Bringing that knowledge back to Florence. Beating Ghiberti, who won the competition to finish this medieval uh, Duomo. And then Brunelleschi said, well, hey, how are you going to make that dome stand up? <laughs> and he changed everything. He universalized the measuring system. So it was, what I'm saying is, obviously there's going to be people who do what is right in their own mind. But I would say right in their own mind. But how does something new begin? You have to step up. I read someplace else that when the Florentines went to Venice, two city-states, on their horses, after this huge pandemic, they were so different from the Florentines. They, we would say they must have landed from a spaceship because they're thinking. And you know from your study of geometry, the shape of our body is the shape of our energy. So they were coming with new information, forms being informed, and no wonder the French invited the Italians to the French court. The, the Italians were so far ahead. Now, how all this played out in your part of the world is your part of the story. So, inhabiting the earth, the cosmos by surrendering. And there's no paradox. If you meet a paradox, para in Sanskrit means beyond. We have to go beyond the paradoxes. They are the fences locking them in this downward spiral. Woo! So, if, if, this, um, if we think about, you said, legends and myths and what people have learned, what we accept as normal, I wonder if this is a good time to reconsider the structure of language. Uh. So, if if the written word had never been invented and we had continued to share stories and share experiences, if our understanding of many more things would be far less linear than they are now because language is constricting. The English language has its restrictions, hieroglyphics have their restrictions, Sanskrit has its restrictions. We go to a shrine and people lose themselves. The word we use in Urdu is hal, hal adya. So hal is very, it's a very, it's a very airy sound. It's very guttural. It's coming from the bottom of your lungs. And that's what's happening. You're losing your breath. 
you're transcending. And those are the words that you were mentioning yesterday, and I'm thinking about it after we finished our chat, that what example can I give you? And the word that we use is hal. The word in dervishes go into hal. At the shrines, when the when the fakirs, the, the people who live at shrines, when they listen to the music and they transcend, they all go into hal, that change of state of mind, the trance. So I wonder if if today in the digital age everything has become abbreviations of acronyms so we, we barely communicate in entire sentences you know for instance in twitter you have a hundred and some characters and you've got to convey an entire message well, there's no thomas hardy there's no shakespeare all of that elaborate expression of desire of place of being of shifting of loss of time and place, Dostoevsky, crime and punishment, suddenly it's all become irrelevant because you've got to fit everything into 111 characters before the other person is willing to accept your communication. So if we were to go back and imagine the universe without the books that were first written, without the manuscripts, without anyone actually writing their edited version of the moment, which then became history. If that documentation had remained storytelling mm -hmm. and myth legendary, what would we have evolved as humans? Because like you said, we've been so conditioned to believe the linear path, to believe the linear process, when we all know that our brains are not wired that way, that our experiences don't happen that way. We do have a word called holistic experience. Those mm -hmm. two words have existed if that process didn't exist. There would have yes. been no to have those two words be there. Uh, if, if that, right? And then yeah. we talk about heritage for nature, heritage of earth, heritage revival of the earth energy. As much as mine. Where suddenly our culture and our time and our location doesn't matter because the issues are the same that we share. Yeah. It's our region right now, we're talking about shared heritage. And it's unfortunate that, well, I suppose that the conversation has just begun, so they're limiting it to buildings. But actually, the shared heritage is a much larger uh, sphere of topics to discuss. Um, and I think where, like you said, you know, yesterday, you were concerned about what Parsons or any equivalent higher education, well-respected higher educational institution will do with this new world order that's been created. And I'm not so sure, Jean, that we're making those decisions. I think this is, in my mind, um, human fallacy to believe that we're in charge of that decision making. <laughs> yes, yes. The decisions are being made for us. And if we were to just accept that and listen to those very messages which you're talking about, follow, as opposed to, I have made a decision. So I think that until the mm. I we talked about yesterday doesn't crumble and doesn't surrender entirely, we will not have learned from this pandemic. So I, I think the written word needs to be questioned and its value in terms of what it documents and what it doesn't document historians are not giving you necessarily the entire picture. They're oh. giving you as much of a picture as they can in a sentence, on a page, in a book. It doesn't have a million other equally valuable uh, pieces of that memory because you can't write down 90% of it. They're only writing 10% or less at best. So I think this would be a great time in our lives as the shift, I think, I think this emergence, as you said, of another spiral that we have to follow to bring us back up and create balance, re recreate balance. And as you said, we need to co-create. So we need to co-create that balance and let go of many of the things we've understood as norms. And I think books, and linear writing and words, especially the Latin-based languages, I think do us a lot of disservice. 
So, in in terms of my understanding of the Eastern languages versus the Latin-based languages, so that would be a great thing to question. The other issue is, Jean, we have about ten minutes left mm. before Instagram cuts us off. Uh, I have Digital. One, yes, we can always sign back on again if you want to continue talking, and I'm not disrupting your breakfast. Then we can sign back on. Not a problem. But I know that in, in ten minutes, it will it will beg for me to make some space for it. Um, how how do you think this is going to impact curriculum, our education? Well, this is exactly the place that my colleagues and myself are articulating and asking for each of us to express our understanding. And Parsons is organized in a hierarchical manner, which is not my uh, understanding of what the next steps need. But, so, we're each being asked as full-time faculty members in the School of Constructed Environments in Parsons, which is part of the new school, a huge university. So, all these opinions are being gathered. Exactly the questions that you're asking. And we're being given like four or five choices about how what the future is. And they are listed in a linear way. They aren't systemically related to anything except are we going to be on site? Are we going to have a hybrid? Or are we going to be totally online? No consideration that this is an, a medical life and death issue. What we decide if we bring students back to New York in a time when the virus is still strong, it's a death decision. So there's no contextual decision making and language in its linear and Marshall McLuhan understanding media is the source to go to yes. because he goes back to the oral communication, the body communication and, and scholars. before Sanskrit and then broke into the language as we know today. There are ten roots. English, although it has many Latin and Greek words, English is more an Aryan language. So we actually, that's in this chart that I have of where all the existing languages came from, going back to Sanskrit, but then there's something they haven't identified yet. So this new world order and how we make a decision. This is what I meant by each, we have to each look to our bodies, pay attention to the feeling tone of what we're deciding, sit on the earth. I woke up this morning because it was still dark, but the birds felt the, what we call the first light and they were singing. So tuning your body which is going to be always off the clock. The clock is just like language. It's some, no machine is going to duplicate. So language, yes. Going back to uh, phonetics, to finding something that's representative of sound. So sound to me is the connector. And that's why those stories are so powerful, the legends. Even, you know, we may, we've dismissed them as children's stories. But once you've heard a mountain speak to you, or once you've listened to a bird, those are the messages. That's the feeling tone I'm talking about. So this idea of the new world order may be scaled down to many interconnected like uh, a spider web interconnected this chaos theory a butterfly flaps its wings here in Pennsylvania and you feel it later we have to change the way we order because ordering is the lock that we're caught in the way we are ordered is on a phenomenon that is beyond 
we have to be double dutch we have to jump in we're not gonna if we ask for complete standing under understanding it's going to be at the feeling tone and then comes right action spontaneity because you're standing in the visceral connection to this unnameable except through sound through legend so quickly in our last few minutes do you think that the buildings that i take people to the sites that we call sacred now and yesterday you said they were not sacred when they were built they were living environments they were functioning they were off the moment they become sacred now do you think that our body listening to what those buildings have to say is as important as listening to the earth would you say it's the same thing i'd say that those buildings are those kinds of constructions are manifestations of listening to the earth so when you go into them this is why the the romanesque early medieval churches in the south of france are so powerful because the chanting that went on was a reciprocal response to the unheard sounds making them heard so yes all these things are like plants growing out of the soil and the vibrations and the impulses and the materials of the earth so they're not you know if they're aligned in a, this way of dynamics there can be a, a crystallization a constellation of the energies of the earth because the architect chose the site because it was a confluence a body a con- you know so that like stonehenge so that at a certain point when the cosmos is lined up and the planet vibrations are caught by these places woo-hoo! you're going to make a joyful noise and that noise will tell other people what you heard <laughs> So Jane the thing I mean this is amazing you have left me with so many questions for the our audience has many more we've talked about uh many things that are not topics that one often gets to talk about and certainly in any kind of mainstream history education earth practice we're not talking about any of these things and i wonder if these are conversations that you and i can have again and if we can build on this would that be something that would be of interest to you to actually build these conversations because then i can uh, offline between now and the next time actually make a list of some of the topics we spoke about and see what feedback we get from our viewers today um and then maybe we can turn this into a series of conversations if that would be okay with you yes yes <laughs> i feel i feel really- other that we um end uh, in a yes. nice yes. near back and if if this has been interesting to you i would love to certainly continue these conversations i think the feedback which i can see showing up is certainly looking positive um and cross continental cross time zones cross generations cross cultures if we can develop these conversations um this will be recorded just like yesterday's was i will share the recordings with you so we have them in our own archives and who knows what will come out of this in our intuitive reaction to responses to what you say to me and vice versa so if that would be great i would love to invite you back on another yes. conversation like this and we can continue and then between now and the next 3 days because i do these chats every 3 days uh we can chat offline and see if there's anything else i can share with you in the meantime and we can maybe structure this a little bit oh structure there's the word <laughs> Okay. All right. The order we create that has order got to be open. <laughs> yes, cuz we don't